Chapter Four of *The Hour of the Dragon* by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. *The Hour of the Dragon*, Chapter Four. From what hell have you crawled? Of that long ride in the chariot of Zaltotun, Conan knew nothing. He lay like a dead man while the bronze wheels clashed over the stones of mountain roads and swished through the deep grass of fertile valleys, and finally, dropping down from the rugged heights, rumbled rhythmically along the broad white road that winds through the rich meadowlands to the walls of Belverus. Just before dawn some faint reviving of life touched him. He heard a mumble of voices, the groan of ponderous hinges. Through a slit in the cloak that covered him he saw, faintly in the lurid glare of torches, the great black arch of a gateway, and the bearded faces of men-at-arms, the torches striking fire from their spearheads and helmets. "'How went the battle, my fair lord?' spoke an eager voice in the Nemedian tongue. "'Well, indeed,' was the curt reply. "'The king of Aquilonia lies slain, and his host is broken.' A babble of excited voices rose, drowned the next instant by the whirling wheels of the chariot on the flags. Sparks flashed from under the revolving rims as Zalto Toon lashed his steeds through the arch. But Conan heard one of the guardsmen mutter, "'From beyond the border to Belverus between sunset and dawn, and the horses scarcely sweating. By Mitra they—' Then silence drank the voices, and there was only the clatter of hoofs and wheels along the shadowy street. What he had heard registered itself on Conan's brain, but suggested nothing to him. He was like a mindless automaton that hears and sees, but does not understand. Sights and sounds flowed meaninglessly about him. He lapsed again into a deep lethargy, and was only dimly aware when the chariot halted in a deep, high-walled court and he was lifted from it by many hands and borne up a winding stone stair, and down a long dim corridor. Whispers, stealthy footsteps, unrelated sounds surged or rustled about him, irrelevant and far away. Yet his ultimate awakening was abrupt and crystal clear. He possessed full knowledge of the battle in the mountains and its sequences, and he had a good idea of where he was. He lay on a velvet couch, clad as he was the day before, but with his limbs loaded with chains not even he could break. The room in which he lay was furnished with somber magnificence, the walls covered with black velvet tapestries, the floor with heavy purple carpets. There was no sign of door or window, and one curiously carven gold lamp, swinging from the fretted ceiling, shed a lurid light over all. In that light the figure seated in a silver, throne-like chair before him seemed unreal and fantastic, with an elusiveness of outline that was heightened by a filmy silken robe. But the features were distinct, unnaturally so in that uncertain light. It was almost as if a weird nimbus played about the man's head, casting the bearded face into bold relief so that it was the only definite and distinct reality in that mystic, ghostly chamber. It was a magnificent face, with strongly chiseled features of classical beauty. There was, indeed, something disquieting about the calm tranquillity of its aspect, a suggestion of more than human knowledge, of a profound certitude beyond human assurance. Also, an uneasy sensation of familiarity twitched at the back of Conan's consciousness. He had never seen this man's face before, he well knew. Yet those features reminded him of something or someone. It was like encountering in the flesh some dream image that had haunted one in nightmares. "'Who are you?' demanded the king belligerently, struggling to a sitting position in spite of his chains. Men call me Zaltotun, was the reply in a strong, golden voice. "'What place is this?' the Cimmerian next demanded. "'A chamber in the palace of King Taraskus in Belverus.' Conan was not surprised. Belverus, the capital, was at the same time the largest Nemedian city so near the border. "'And where's Taraskus?' 
with the army. Well, growled Conan, if you mean to murder me, why don't you do it and get it over with? I did not save you from the king's archers to murder you in Belverus, answered Zaltotun. What the devil did you do to me? demanded Conan. I blasted your consciousness, answered Zaltotun. How, you would not understand. Call it black magic, if you will." Conan had already reached that conclusion and was mulling over something else. "'I think I understand why you spared my life,' he rumbled. "'Amalric wants to keep me as a check on Valerius, in case the impossible happens and he becomes king of Aquilonia. It's well known that the Baron of Tor is behind this move to seat Valerius on my throne. And if I know Amalric, he doesn't intend that Valerius shall be anything more than a figurehead, as Tarascus is now." "'Amalric knows nothing of your capture,' answered Zaltotun. "'Neither does Valerius. Both think you died at Valkia.' Conan's eyes narrowed as he stared at the man in silence. "'I sensed a brain behind all this,' he muttered. "'But I thought it was Amalric's. Are Amalric, Tarascus, and Valerius all but puppets dancing on your string? Who are you?" What does it matter? If I told you, you would not believe me. What if I told you I might set you back on the throne of Aquilonia?" Conan's eyes burned on him like a wolf. What's your price? Obedience to me. Go to hell with your offer, snarled Conan. I'm no figurehead. I won my crown with my sword. Besides, it's beyond your power to buy and sell the throne of Aquilonia at your will. The kingdom's not conquered. One battle doesn't decide a war." "'You war against more than swords,' answered Zaltotun. "'Was it a mortal sword that felled you in your tent before the fight? Nay, it was a child of the dark, a waif of outer space whose fingers were afire with the frozen coldness of the black gulfs, which froze the blood in your veins and the marrow of your thews, coldness so cold it burned your flesh like white-hot iron. Was it chance that led the man who wore your harness to lead his knights into the defile, chance that brought the cliffs crashing down upon them? Conan glared at him unspeaking feeling a chill along his spine. Wizards and sorcerers abounded in his barbaric mythology, and any fool could tell that this was no common man. Conan sensed an inexplicable something about him that set him apart, an alien aura of time and space, a sense of tremendous and sinister antiquity. But his stubborn spirit refused to flinch. The fall of the cliffs was chance he muttered truculently. The charge into the defile was what any man would have done. Not so. You would not have led a charge into it. You would have suspected a trap. You would never have crossed the river in the first place, until you were sure the Nemedian route was real. Hypnotic suggestions would not have invaded your mind, even in the madness of battle, to make you mad, and rush blindly into the trap laid for you, as it did the lesser man who masqueraded as you. Then if this was all planned, Conan grunted skeptically, all a plot to trap my host, why did not the child of darkness kill me in my tent? Because I wish to take you alive. It took no wizardry to predict that Palantides would send another man out in your harness. I wanted you alive and unhurt. You may fit into my scheme of things. There is a vital power about you greater than the craft and cunning of my allies. You are a bad enemy, but might make a fine vassal." Conan spat savagely at the word, and Zaltotun, ignoring his fury, took a crystal globe from a nearby table and placed it before him. He did not support it in any way, nor place it on anything but it hung motionless in mid-air, as solidly as if it rested on an iron pedestal. Conan snorted at this bit of necromancy, 
but he was nevertheless impressed. "'Would you know of what goes on in Aquilonia?' he asked. Conan did not reply, but the sudden rigidity of his form betrayed his interest. Zaltutun stared into the cloudy depths, and spoke. "'It is now the evening of the day after the Battle of Valkia. Last night the main body of the army camped by Valkia, while squadrons of knights harried the fleeing Aquilonians. At dawn the host broke camp and pushed westward through the mountains. Prospero, with ten thousand Poitanians, was miles from the battlefield when he met the fleeing survivors in the early dawn. He had pushed on all night, hoping to reach the field before the battle joined. Unable to rally the remnants of the broken host, he fell back toward Tarantia. Riding hard, replacing his wearied horses with steeds seized from the countryside, he approaches Tarantia. I see his weary knights, their armor gray with dust, their pennons drooping as they push their tired horses through the plain. I see also the streets of Tarantia. The city is in turmoil. Somehow word has reached the people of the defeat and the death of King Conan. The mob is mad with fear, crying out that the king is dead, and there is none to lead them against the Nemedians. Giant shadows rush on Aquilonia from the east, and the sky is black with vultures." Conan cursed deeply. "'What are these but words? The raggedest beggar in the street might prophesy as much. If you say you saw all that in the glass ball, then you're a liar as well as a knave, of which last there's no doubt. Prospero will hold Tarantia, and the barons will rally to him. Count Trocero of Poitain commands the kingdom in my absence, and he'll drive these Nemedian dogs howling back to their kennels. What are fifty thousand Nemedians? Aquilonia will swallow them up. They'll never see Belverus again. It's not Aquilonia which has conquered at Valkia, it was only Conan." "'Aquilonia is doomed,' answered Zaltotun, unmoved. "'Lance and axe and torch shall conquer her. Or, if they fail, powers from the dark of ages shall march against her. As the cliffs fell at Valkia, so shall walled cities and mountains fall, if the need arise, and rivers roar from their channels to drown whole provinces. Better if steel and bowstring prevail without further aid from the arts, for the constant use of mighty spells sometimes sets forces in motion that might rock the universe. From what hell have you crawled, you knighted dog? muttered Conan, staring at the man. The Cimmerian involuntarily shivered. He sensed something incredibly ancient, incredibly evil. Zaltotun lifted his head, as if listening to whispers across the void. He seemed to have forgotten his prisoner. Then he shook his head impatiently and glanced impersonally at Conan. What? Why, if I told you, you would not believe me. But I am wearied of this conversation with you. It is less fatiguing to destroy a walled city than it is to frame my thoughts in words a brainless barbarian can understand." "'If my hands were free,' opined Conan, "'I'd soon make a brainless corpse out of you.' "'I do not doubt it. If I were fool enough to give you the opportunity,' answered Zaltotun, clapping his hands. His manner had changed, there was impatience in his tone, and a certain nervousness in his manner, though Conan did not think this attitude was in any way connected with himself. "'Consider what I have told you, barbarian,' said Zaltotun. "'You will have plenty of leisure. I have not yet decided what I shall do with you. It depends on circumstances yet unborn. But let this be impressed upon you, that if I decide to use you in my game, it will be better to submit without resistance than to suffer my wrath." Conan spat a curse at him, just as hangings that masked a door swung apart, and four giant negroes entered. Each was clad only in a silken breechcloth supported by a girdle, from which hung a great key. Zaltotun gestured impatiently toward the king and turned away, as if dismissing the matter entirely from his mind. His fingers twitched queerly. 
From a carbon-green jade box he took a handful of shimmering black dust, and placed it in a brazier which stood on a golden tripod at his elbow. The crystal globe, which he seemed to have forgotten, fell suddenly to the floor, as if its invisible support had been removed. Then the blacks had lifted Conan, for so loaded with chains was he that he could not walk, and carried him from the chamber. A glance back, before the heavy gold-bound teak door was closed, showed him Zaltotun leaning back in his throne-like chair, his arms folded, while a thin wisp of smoke curled up from the brazier. Conan's scalp prickled. In Stygia, that ancient and evil kingdom that lay far to the south, he had seen such black dust before. It was the pollen of the black lotus, which creates death-like sleep and monstrous dreams and he knew that only the grisly wizards of the Black Ring, which was the nadir of evil, voluntarily seek the scarlet nightmares of the Black Lotus to revive their necromantic powers. The Black Ring was a fable and a lie to most folk of the Western world, but Conan knew of its ghastly reality and its grim votaries who practiced their abominable sorceries amid the black vaults of Stygia, and the nighted domes of a cursed Sabatia. He glanced back at the cryptic gold-bound door, shuddering at what it hid. Whether it was day or night the king could not tell. The palace of King Taraska seemed a shadowy, nighted place, that shunned natural illumination. The spirit of darkness and shadow hovered over it, and that spirit, Conan felt, was embodied in the stranger Zaltotun. The negroes carried the king along a winding corridor so dimly lighted that they moved through it like black ghosts bearing a dead man, and down a stone stair that wound endlessly. A torch in the hand of one cast the great deformed shadow streaming along the wall. It was like the descent into hell of a corpse borne by dusky demons. At last they reached the foot of the stair, and then they traversed a long straight corridor with a blank wall in one hand pierced by an occasional arched doorway with a stair leading up behind it, and on the other hand another wall showing heavy barred doors at regular intervals of a few feet. Halting before one of these doors, one of the blacks produced the key that hung at his girdle, and turned it in the lock. Then pushing open the grill, they entered with their captive. They were in a small dungeon with heavy stone walls, floor and ceiling and in the opposite wall there was another grilled door. What lay beyond that door Conan could not tell, but he did not believe it was another corridor. The glimmering light of the torch, flickering through the bars, hinted at shadowy spaciousness and echoing depths. In one corner of the dungeon, near the door through which they had entered, a cluster of rusty chains hung from a great iron ring set in the stone. In these chains a skeleton dangled. Conan glared at it with some curiosity, noticing the state of the bare bones, most of which were splintered and broken. The skull which had fallen from the vertebrae was crushed as if by some savage blow of tremendous force. Stolidly, one of the blacks, not the one who had opened the door, removed the chains from the ring, using his key on the massive lock and dragged the mass of rusty metal and shattered bones over to one side. Then they fastened Conan's chains to that ring, and the third black turned his key in the lock of the farther door, grunting when he had assured himself that it was properly fastened. Then they regarded Conan cryptically, slit-eyed ebony giants, the torch striking highlights from their glossy skin. He who held the key to the nearer door was moved to remark, gutturally, "'This is your palace now, white dog-king. None but master and we know. All palace sleep. We keep secret. You live and die here, maybe. Like him.' He contemptuously kicked the shattered skull and sent it clattering across the stone floor. Conan did not deign to reply to the taunt, and the black— galled perhaps by his prisoner's silence, muttered a curse, stooped, and spat full in the king's face. It was an unfortunate move for the black. Conan was seated on the floor, the chains about his waist, ankles and wrists locked to the ring in the wall. 
he could neither rise nor move more than a yard out from the wall. But there was considerable slack in the chains that shackled his wrists, and before the bullet-shaped head could be withdrawn out of reach, the king gathered this slack in his mighty hand and smote the black on the head. The man fell like a butchered ox, and his comrades stared to see him lying with his scalp laid open, and blood oozing from his nose and ears. But they attempted no reprisal, nor did they accept Conan's urgent invitation to approach within reach of the bloody chain in his hand. Presently, grunting in their ape-like speech, they lifted the senseless black and bore him out like a sack of wheat, arms and legs dangling. They used his key to lock the door behind them, but did not remove it from the gold chain that fastened it to his girdle. They took the torch with them, and as they moved up the corridor the darkness slunk behind them like an animate thing. Their soft, padding footsteps died away with the glimmer of their torch, and darkness and silence remained unchallenged. End of chapter 4